Welcome, everybody. So we are provisors talking to provisors about a couple key things. The main one being you should do more. If you're just guesting a little bit, you should guess more. If you're only visiting your own group, you should be visiting at least another one. If you're a member of no affinity groups, you should check them out. If you're a member of some, you could be more. I'm talking to some of the most prolific provisors. If you're in provisors, you've definitely heard their names. You've got Mark Hankin and Bell Walker. So without wasting your time with introductions, because you know who they are, I'll put links in the description to learn more. Let's go ahead and jump in. So first and foremost, what do we mean by doing more? Mark, you've got a hand exercise you do. I want to make sure everybody sees it. I do. So look, you go to your home group every month. That's a minimum. If you don't go to your home group, you're missing out on an opportunity. And in the old days, you used to be able to guest up to three times a month. Now those limits are flexible. But let's say you go to four groups, each of them three times a month. That's 12 months. You've now met 80% of the people, improvisers, outside your home group. So you have quintupled your chance of getting a referral. People often say to me and others, they say the regional directors, I think I'm in the wrong home group. I get 80% of my business outside. It's simple arithmetic. You've met four times as many people outside your group as in your group. And if even if everyone in your group loves you, they're not going to have something for you every month or every year. But the other people you meet guesting will. You have to get out there. I do. And yeah. by the way, yeah. if you're getting 100% from your home group, it's not that you get 100% of your referrals from your home group. It's that you get 20% of your referrals from your home group and you're ignoring the other 80%. You're turning them down, letting someone else get them. Beautifully put. And we'll talk a little bit more about how important it is to simply be there because sometimes there are specializations that we're not even aware of that they're missing out on. Bell, you're an amazing example. I mean, you have guested all over. So, I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about how guesting, how doing more has really impacted you and your business? Yeah, for me, I've, I've really focused in on the affinity groups, which has been a tremendous uh, opportunity for me because when I get walk in the door or join the Zoom, I know from the first moment that meeting starts that I have some connection with everybody else there. And so no matter what, what their profession is, what their background is, we're there because that affinity pulled us together. And that's been a fabulous way to start building all those connections that makes provisors so powerful. Yeah. Can you rattle some off? What are some affinity groups if people aren't familiar? What do you recommend? Ooh, uh, I love the Boston Management Coaches and Consultants. That one's near and dear to my heart. Uh, Fourth uh, Wednesday. Yes. <laughs> oh, this is a fun game. Uh, I like the LGBTQ uh, plus allies group. That one's got great. Fourth content. Monday afternoon. Uh, oh, what's another good one? Mark, what's your favorite affinity group? Well, actually, believe it or not, it's the Bay Area Women's Affinity Group that I don't go to their regular meetings because I'm a man, but I do go to their Think Tank Thursday, which at 2 o'clock on Thursdays, East, uh, West Coast time, is the best hour on Zoom. Um, I'm a member of the Distributors and Manufacturers Group in Orange County. I've been on the Executive Committee a long time, but I guess at the Ontario Distributors and Manufacturers, the San Diego Distributors and Manufacturers, the Bay Area Distributors and Manufacturers. I go to a lot of the lawyers groups around. Um, there are wonderful groups for women, there's groups for nonprofit, there's groups for all sorts of things. The Branding, Licensing, Intellectual Property, Blip in LA on the third Wednesday for lunch, and, and that's Harold, Harold Weitzberg, who's a member of my Irvine 3 group, and Cindy Hazel, who runs the San Francisco version, which is, the names change from Babe List to BAMS, anyway, it doesn't matter because it's the fourth Tuesday for lunch, and that's a great group for people who are branding, licensing, intellectual property, marketing, sales, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, for any of the women who aren't guesting at the uh, various women's affinity groups, they are fabulous communities. I would give a special shout out to the East Bay Women's Affinity Group. Uh, they alternate between having external speakers and then uh, internal content. It's, it's always a great way to spend a Friday. So, Belle, some women say, look, I'm liberated. I'm a feminist. I don't want to go to a single gender group. I'm gonna, I want to play with the big boys. What do you say to people like that? I say, why would you turn down an opportunity, right? Either there are many affinity groups that are open to everyone, uh, but the lawyer's affinity groups often are not open to everyone. And if you were a lawyer, would you turn down the lawyer affinity groups because uh, I, I'm not invited to them? And so I would, I would say the same thing applies to the, the women's affinity groups. I agree. You swear by the Boston affinity group, attorney affinity group, right, Mark? The Boston Lawyers Group, <laughs> if you're a lawyer and you're not going to Chris Murphy's Boston Lawyers Group, it meets on the first Friday. Yes, it's four in the morning California time, seven in the morning uh, uh, East Coast time. But it's the biggest and best lawyers group in the country. Sorry to all my friends who run other ones. It's fantastic. Chris Murphy does an amazing job. And it's so many good people there. You know, for, since 2013, 
I've been working with the New England uh, region. I make at least one cross country referral every single week. And I gotta tell you, if you're not guesting in other regions, you are leaving opportunities on the table. It may not be a, a referral for you, but they'll come to you to ask for a referral for someone else. And if they come to you often enough, one day they're gonna need you. That's well put. And when else can we visit a group in Boston the same day that we visit our own home group? I mean, exactly. Mark, you've traveled a lot, but I don't think even you've pulled that off. Well, I used to go in person to go. Now everyone can do it. I actually have had at least two days on Zoom where I was in four or five different regions around the country without leaving this terrible small office I'm confined to these days. I would also say that's another uh, moment to speak in favor of affinity groups, right? Another uh, pitch for the affinity groups is that the Bay Area, I'm sorry, the New England affinity groups meet at 8.30 Pacific time. So if that 4 a.m. time slot is a little intimidating, think about the affinity groups in New England. Uh, they meet later than a home group in the Bay Area. Well, and also, if you read my description for Irvine 3, I always say, come see how much fun a provider's meeting can be. But Tony Laurentano, who's a group leader of Boston 4, the only Boston lunchtime affinity, uh, I'm sorry, lunchtime home group, Boston 4 calls itself the fun group. And I have to tell you, Tony runs a fun meeting. You got to go guess it again. It's 8.30 time, 8.30 West Coast time. So it's much more palatable than the 4 a.m. But Tony runs a great group, the Boston for the fun group. That's amazing. I mean, there are a couple of people. I mean, let's, let's list some here. We can give them shout outs in the comments. I mean, Young, I think, visits. Young, John, he, well, he went to school in Boston. So he goes there a lot for yeah. guests. Who and else he, visits like crazy besides you two? Chris King. And he always did in person. Richard Clayman does in person, and I, I see Richard a lot, but he, he, he was really the person before all this that was closest to me in numbers. Um, but now there's so many people who are outguesting. Regina Lark, group leader of the LGBT plus allies affinity group, she's outguesting like a fiend. Um, so a lot, a lot of people outguesting. It's kind of good. Well, let me Bell, who else do you see regularly? Yeah, well, I'm trying to think who I see regularly. I hear about Sam Lee regularly and have not I've not seen him. Sam Lee. I mean, I know he guests a lot, but I think he and I are going like this in different circles. Which explains <laughs> a lot because I see you all the time, Mark. Hi. Uh, Amrit Dhaliwal. Oh, yeah. She's really picked up. She's a former group leader and she's a very involved member, very well connected. And uh, Elena Daly. I see her. Uh, Alana Daly. I see her all the time. So I got to ask a question. We have people like this who are setting a tremendous example. They're visiting all the time. And I think a lot of people point to them and say, they're different than me. I, I can't make that time. So what do you two say to those that just say, I don't have the time to visit as much as they do? You can't afford not to. If you're busy now, that's great. And if you have always been busy, that's great. When you finish with this work, are you certain there's work waiting for you there? Take the time to network now while you're busy because you got to keep that pipeline filled. And if you're at the point where you're saying I'm not guesting because I'm too busy, that implies you do wish you were getting more business and that you want to guess. So I'm not buying it, right? If you're so busy with work that you, uh, the only reason you're not guesting is because you're so busy, you, what you would really be telling me is I'm not guesting because I have no interest in more business. Since 2007, I've been working with Jerry Bain, who's my coach, and he's a lawyer coach. He's the happy lawyer coach. Jerry does not do business development coaching, but back in 2007, when we started working together, he realized that my highest and best use is networking. That if I sit at my desk working on a brief, I get paid my hourly. If I go out and network, I can bring in more than my hourly by getting to know people like you. And on average, we do better. So all I did was I ramped up my firm and we started adding more people. I have, now we have three members of provisors. We've got Anoush Patel in San Ramon too. We've got Kevin Shraven in the Irvine Concourse. And we all go and we all meet people, but we, have, we, we hire law students, we hire law clerks. Pros. The work is the easy part. It's getting the work that's really hard. And thanks to Jerry's advice, when he told me my highest and best use is going out and networking and guesting, 2008 to 2013, we had six best years ever in a row. Then things were sort of stable. And now in, in, in quarantine, if you're not out guesting, making relationships now that you're going to need after whatever after looks like, you're missing an opportunity. And this is a great chance to get to know people better because you don't have to leave home. You don't have to pay for the airfare, the hotel, the rental car like I used to do. My Uber bill has gone to zero. There's a lot of advantages, too, in the, in the fact that more and more people are, are out of 
work right now, there's an opportunity to bring in new partners on a part-time basis, on a contract basis. If there's a specific uh, task opportunity, you can experiment with bringing in new people to your business, test out your growth right now in a way that might have been more difficult to do a year ago. Well, Erin Gillia, who's in Orange County, runs an organization called Montage Legal, and they provide contract attorneys on an hourly basis. If you have too much work as a lawyer, call Aaron, hire a lawyer for a few more hours, have them do work. These are people who trained at big white shoe firms, blue chip firms, who are, many of them are on the mommy track, and some of them are men who just, for whatever reason, didn't want to be at a firm anymore. And they're great lawyers. You can supplement, you can find people to help you do the work. But there's no substitute for getting out there and meeting people. And that seems like an excellent problem to have. I have too much work on my stack. I think there are many fabulous coaches in the network who can help you with that. And uh, it's a problem that, you know, I think we should all be striving for. So let's get out, guest more, and get ourselves too busy. Absolutely. I, I think both of you know Carol Marzuk, the executive lion tamer, who's in my Corona group. Um, in the two and a half years she's been in Proviso, she has quadrupled her business by guesting, getting to know people, working with other coaches like yourselves, working with HR executives, work, uh, HR uh, consultants, working with employment lawyers. And you know, it's our Corona group is fantastic. Uh, Ann Norris runs the Corona group. And we've really, we're, I hate to say it, we're the best group in the Inland Empire, but there's a lot of advisors in our group because in the Inland Empire, there's a lot of businesses and not a lot of advisors out there. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for people to really get some great business and grow. I love the way you put that, Bell, and, and Mark supporting it. I mean, it's, it's a problem that's not only great to have, but it's a problem that you can easily get into if you network properly. And if you just pick up that gauntlet, not only you survive by other advisors that can help you in the practical implementation of scaling up your company, but you're survive, surrounded by other people doing the same. I mean, Mark, you've scaled up your organization. Bell, you're talking about scaling up yours. I'm scaling up mine. And it's something that you can talk to somebody peer to peer. Hey, what's working for you? Either another attorney, another advice, a consultant, even somebody that's more of a CPA or attorney. I mean, banker. All along the lines, there are other people that have similar business models to yours and they can give you advice of that. So well, there's, yeah. there's three lawyers I know that were improvisers for a long time and had firms that were nice. They, through their provisors, connections, and others, they have grown their firms dramatically. Uh, Darren Ennenstein, uh, unbelievable growth. He's in Encino One. Jeff Sklar, who was in CC, uh, CC6. Jeff, it started with two lawyers back when I, around the time I started my group because one of their outside lawyers came to my group as my GLA and they, they've just grown dramatically. And um, Harry Nelson, who took his firm from little to huge and they're the biggest healthcare firm in California. They're one of the best healthcare firms in the country and they host a lot of providers groups in the real world because they recognize the, the power of networking, the power of getting to know people. And those firms have grown very wonderfully because of providers' connections and work that they've gotten through providers. I think you hit on something really important about being able to connect with, with peers, Leo, right? I uh, had a wonderful conversation uh, Friday morning with Camia Roberson, uh, where she and I talked about sort of some of the, the challenges and opportunities in our own businesses, shared advice back and forth, and it was incredibly valuable for, for both of us, I hope, <laughs> definitely for me. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because it's almost a Jeopardy answer. This is the answer before the question. But a lot of people are worried about embarrassment. They're worried about being vulnerable in front of others, maybe standing up, giving a testimonial that doesn't come off right, they miss something, or really expressing to others, I'm not the person that I sometimes pretend to be that has everything together. I'm the perfect referral for your clients. But instead saying, you know what, there's some cracks here that I'm trying to fix. I'm trying to scale up, trying to get better, trying to grow. And that's where it's that Jeopardy answer. It's that vulnerability. So can you both talk about how the, it's actually a, a power. It is a very productive thing to share your vulnerability with others. Can you talk more about that instead of hiding it? It's one of the most fundamental tenets of, of leadership, right? And Provisors is a network of peers, uh, but as we are soliciting each other's business, I think there's a desire to demonstrate our own leadership in our areas of expertise and in our professions and vulnerability and honesty is fundamental to genuine leadership and successful leadership. And so if you want to show up in that best light uh, in any public forum, 
you're going to need to be willing to take on a little bit of vulnerability or people aren't going to believe it. We all know no one's perfect. So if you tell me you are, my, my immediate response is not going to be, oh, good. My response is going to be, ooh, where is the crack? Yeah, because then we're looking for it, right? <laughs> no, Brene Brown could not have said that better. Vulnerability is so important. And, you know, here's the thing. Nobody should try to be me or be anyone else when they stand up. They should try to be the best they they can be. And it's a room of supportive people. It's a room of people that want you to succeed. We want you to benefit and do better next year than you did last year. And we'll help you do it. Just give us the tools. Let us know how you think. Let us see how your mind works so we can relate to you and understand you. And when you let us know and give us client success stories and put things in our mind of when you succeed the most, when you shine, when we're with our clients or our colleagues or we hear stories of people who need the skills and services you provide, that's when we can deliver you and we want to. So help us to understand your sweet spot. Let us know what you really do best. Don't tell us what you do best. Show us through a good story and through testimonials. Yeah. And that, that's two things I really want to highlight. One is just if somebody really shows their passion, their expertise, and I, I love the way you two said it off camera, is, is also it's more, so much more about show me, don't tell me, don't try to sell me, show me through implementation. It's one of the reasons that so many affinity groups have such good speakers that show up and really show what they do instead of just trying to sell it. Um, but that testimonial component as well, I really want to talk about that too, because it, it is the power of provisors, the testimonials. Can you two speak a little bit? And this is probably a whole other video we need to make. Um, sure. Your protocol. I'll tell you about this, but I'm going. I'm going on record right now that I am starting my campaign today. Yes. I've, been, I've been laying the groundwork for months. I am on a campaign to eradicate the false and divisive concept that is thank ammonial. It doesn't exist. It's not a thing. No one needs to use that word ever again. A testimonial is a testimonial is a testimonial, and group leaders need to stop making members and guests feel bad for the quality of their testimonials. I don't care if it's closed business or a referral to somebody who's a connector. Frankly, I've met the two of you. We've gotten to know each other on Zoom. We've never been in the room together, but we know each other really well. I don't care what anyone calls it. Getting to know somebody who can refer people for your business for the next five, 10, 20 years is equally or way more valuable than one piece of closed business. So when people make distinctions between that, it, it's, it's divisive and it's a, a killer to commerce. It's a disincentive to people networking. Your meetings regularly have 150 testimonials, Mark. We average over 100, but we've hit, two, we've, we've hit 199. If I'd known I have 85 lists I, on my list, I could have given one more. But we've been over 150 at least four or five times. We average 100 most months. So let it be known, the record of crossing 200 is still unhit, right? Well, the Boston Lawyers Group does that, but they're an affinity group. <laughs> so it's, oh, first it's home funny. group to hit 200 testimonials. They yeah. have that cup, not for long though. Right, exactly. So there's a whole protocol behind giving testimonials. I don't know if we'll get too in depth. I love how you talk about that, Marco, the core of it, and, and whether it's called one thing or another, it's really just telling everybody in the room why somebody else is great. And that's so powerful because who cares if I'm telling how great I am? You really care about other people saying that about you. So can you give a little bit of advice to somebody who's starting out, really wants to give more testimonials, and maybe is just caught just reading the details that's already on the printout, and they really want to get to the core of why somebody's great. Can you help them on that journey? Absolutely. You can look up David Rothblum in Beverly Hills. David is a, literally gives the best testimonials in all the provisors. But I have to say, there's two folks in the Bay Area that have elevated this to a new level. Richard Wong, my, my, my brother of another mother, Richard Wong, group leader, Mount View One, does amazing testimonials and does all sorts of stuff with his screen and his background for, for giving testimonials to really making people shine. But the, the win has to go to Saja Rauf. Saja is an immigration lawyer and her Zoomonials are absolutely the best in the business. She makes, because her husband's a movie maker, he's taught her, she makes movies about people and then shows them it's incredible. It is really the, the, the best. But here's the thing. You don't have to be Saja Rahu for Richard Wong or Mark Hankin or David Rothblum. What you have to do is make the other person look good. It's, when you talk about yourself, we don't necessarily believe you. When you talk about your partner or your colleague or someone you work with or have referred back and forth with, 
you can give us insight into what they do really well, how they think, how great they are. Try not to use those tired phrases, extraordinaire, get on the bandwagon, blah, blah, blah. But explain to us who that person is and why. And just getting up to do it makes you look good by making them look good. If you're doing business with them and they're doing business with you, it makes you look good. It's, it's, it's success by association. One thing that I always appreciate and that I try to do when I'm giving testimonials is just take a few seconds to ask. You know, Leo, if I'm giving you a testimonial, what, what would you like me to make sure I say about you? Right, I, if I'm giving a testimonial, it's somebody that I know uh, I have those, those personal tidbits I can bring to the table and I intend to because that's the authenticity that Mark is speaking to. But there's always room for an extra sentence, right? And, and if that sentence can be just the sentence that the person who I am uh, promoting and, and thanking with this testimonial, it's the sentence they wanna hear, then that's just an extra little boost that will be uh, you know, rewarding for everyone. Mark, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Uh, yeah, I was going to say this. We, we don't pay referral fees and provisors. You know, some people send a bottle of wine or a thank you or something. Some people send handwritten cards. You're never going to get a handwritten card from me. Don't expect it. But when you make somebody look good, they want to help you again. So you make them look good again. It is the most self-serving thing in the world to give a good testimonial and make somebody feel good about themselves so they then want to give you more work and feel good about themselves again and again and again. It's incredible. And when I say it, people look at me like I'm funny, but it's self-serving to give a good testimonial. So get up and do it. And frankly, call them up in advance, email them, chat with them. What would you like me to say about you today to make you really shine? I don't do that often enough. I think all of us need to do that more often. But when you get up and tell us something about the other person, that we didn't know, it's a wonderful way for that network to get tighter. You know, we're all in this. We say no, like, trust, refer. Well, the no and the like really brings it closer so we can trust each other and then make those referrals. It's not rocket science. Just get up and do it. I've actually had moments where in asking uh, about those little tidbits to include, I've learned something new about uh, the person's business that right. has given me a new opportunity to send them additional business, which is... Well, in Bell, you learn something new about the person, and we do business with people we like. They find commonality. Susan Schwartz, who's a colleague of both of yours and um, a fellow coach, Susan and I found out that we have... The closest thing I have to a cousin was in college with Susan, and she knows their family. And from Maryland, we, we have a family, uh, my close family and her friends in common that we found through provisors we never knew in, in, a, in, a, in a troika. <laughs> a wonderful thing. That's amazing. I love that. And, and that's such a good palpable, implementable technique as to how. And that's really what we're going to start transitioning into is the specific things that people could do in order to do more. And I love, by the way, that the three of us acknowledge specifically things that we can do to do more because we're here alongside you to do that and to really pour more in so we can not only get more out, but also give more. So I just want to acknowledge two things really briefly. One of them, we talked about a couple things, reasons why not to do more. There's saying you don't have enough time. There's saying I can't scale up. There's being worried about being vulnerable. Um, something we'll touch a little bit more on later, that exclusivity component as well. Some people are worried saying, oh, somebody else does the same thing as me. I shouldn't show up at their group. That's actually one of the biggest mistakes there is, and we'll talk about why. But if you're listening to this and you have a reason that we haven't covered, because this is just a list we came up with before sitting down of reasons why not, add it to the comments. Let us know. We'll even do another video maybe eventually about if it's a really palpable one, because we want to know, because we want to make sure that we can help you handle that so that you can in turn do more. So as we transition over to how, any more comments on that or the exclusivity element so we can really start giving people step-by-step -step instructions to do more? Exclusivity is a red herring. If you are so insecure about the quality of your work that you're afraid of somebody else who might do something similar, you don't really belong in provisors. And frankly, if you're any good at what you do, no one's gonna bother you. I mean, think about your firms. We have people with 200, 300, 400 people in the firm who do the same thing they do. They don't view them as competition. They don't view them as, as something to worry about. My group is Noah's Ark. We built it with the principle that we're gonna have two of everything except the things we have three of. I'm a patent lawyer. We hosted at Kenobi Martin's, biggest and best patent firm in the world. 
Why, why not? I mean, my host, Brian Clausen, and I have been opposing counsel twice and co-counsel a third time. We literally work on the same cases. So what? We have such differences in our, in our uh, Venn diagram. Our sweet spots are really different. It doesn't matter. We've got two of everything. Why not go into a room and not only not be afraid of the people in that room that do what you do, embrace them, get to know them better because they're the ones who are gonna understand your sweet spot better than anybody else in that room. And they're the ones who stand the best chance to give you things that aren't perfect for them, but might be perfect for you and vice versa. It's a great opportunity to grow. It's just a growth mindset. It's an abundance mindset. If you look at it as scarcity, you're gonna be scarce. The people who are hoarding are gonna not have much to eat. The people who are out there willing to give and willing to share people in their space, there's more work out there than any of us could possibly do. Seeing you that there's for yourself. Yeah. Seeing that there's someone in the room who does what you do, in my opinion, is a great sign that you should go be in that room and meet that person. Because few people uh, understand what I do as well as the people who have some overlap with me. And I have never yet met someone who does exactly what I do. And I would uh, challenge any of you to find someone who does exactly what you do because they're not you. Right? You bring your own personality, you bring your own experience, your own background to everything that you do. And the people who are going to appreciate those nuances the most are going to be the ones with the most similarities. And it allows uh, me also, I can make some of my most confident referrals to the people who seemingly might be very similar to me because I know exactly how they're not similar to me and why they are the right fit for whoever I'm pointing them towards. That's great. I think Bell and I are a great example of that. That's something I've really enjoyed. I mean, immediately after our meeting, by coming in there with that abundance mindset that Mark just described, we could realize how dramatically different we are. Because I'm in the same boat. I haven't found anybody else that does exactly what I do. And every time I find somebody similar, it helps me get more specific in doing what I do best. And it's beautiful. Because I mean, it, it's not only helped me help my clients better by introducing you to them, but immediately there was commerce to the tunes of thousands of dollars. So just quite clearly, if you're not going out there and networking, especially with the people that it looks like they do what you do, you are leaving thousands and thousands of dollars on the table. Right? Tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. And Leo, now I'm going to pick on you a little bit. Please. Because the magic in Provisors takes place in the affinity groups. Mm -hmm. And it's the affinity groups where there's people who are in a similar space to you, where those Venn diagrams yeah. are most obvious. Go to the human capital affinity group. Go to the coaches affinity group. And like Bell said, you'll find people who are in a similar space. On paper, you look similar. But in the reality, you actually have different sweet spots and no one will understand it better than people that are in that similar space that can figure out your sweet spot. That's why people need to be going not only to home groups for guesting, but need to be going to affinity groups and go to affinity groups in other regions because now's the opportunity to make connections that will last for the rest of your career. And going to more affinity groups is going to absolutely ramp up your business. And what Mark was going to pick on me about is the fact that I have only visited one affinity group meeting. I'm In two years. I'm ashamed of this. Yeah, since 2018. And, and there's no excuse for it. But there's a component to it that I just want to highlight, which is one of the impetuses for this meeting, is somebody told me affinity groups aren't worth it. And they couldn't have been farther from the truth. And I listened to that and just took that for what it is. So that's why we wanted to have this conversation and provide advice. It's a lot more supported by data, a lot more supported by some very high performing provisors and also people that have been cited that hopefully will chime up in the comments that can share best practices. So you, dear listener, if you have a method that's really worked for you in provisors, please share it in the comments. Let's start diving into those because one of the biggest ones, and this goes to the practicality of having a tough time with making the time. Mark, you used to plan out meetings six months in advance. Now I had, you don't I had to get hotels and airfare and all that. Exactly. So, I mean, how do you, what's the logistics now? I mean, somebody like you that visits as much as you need to, do you still need to plan months in advance? So some groups are going to sell out for a while. My group sold out the rest of 2020. There are groups that are booking seats for October and November. And there's other groups that, no offense to them, but you can sign up the day before or the week before. What I like to do is I like to look at, because, look, for a long time, we weren't sure how long Zoom was going to last. I think we now realize we're definitely into second quarter of 2021, maybe third quarter, but for sure, for sure, we're on Zoom till April or May of next year. That's, that's a guarantee. I, I, I would defy anyone to tell me I'm wrong about that. No one's announced that officially, but I'm telling you that. So plan your months, plan your year. Go look at least one month in advance, maybe two months in advance, and schedule what meetings are right for you. You know, in the old days, we used to say, go three times so they can get to know you. 
that rule still applies. Go three times to get to know you. Now, some of the group leaders are a little slow in approving, and they're saying, well, I want to give chances to more different other people. Look, the same rules apply. Send an email to the group leader of the group where you want to go guest. Hey, Bill, I want to come to your group three of the next four months. Will you please let me in? Here's what I'd like to do. And then what you do is you go and you get to know people and get to meet them and, and spend time with them. Be there from 7 to 7.30 or whatever, half hour before whatever time the meeting lasts. Don't plan anything right afterwards. You can do an instant troika or just have a pickup conversation. Use the chat. You know, a lot, a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to turn off the chat. We're not going to, we want you to focus on the meeting. Okay, look, I like to focus on the meeting, but the chat's a great way to get to have side conversations with people and get to know them better and just start doing it. I would add to that, everything there is fabulous advice. And I would add, don't be shy about reaching out to someone who you heard introduce themselves and didn't end up in your troika, right? There's, you can request and it's great, but if you don't get them, there's nothing stopping you from sending an email and saying, you know, I really, really am interested in learning more about you. Bell, whether it's an affinity group or a home group, I view the meeting as the menu. Here's what it is. We have 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, whatever number of people in the room. You're gonna have 30 to 40 to 60 to whatever seconds to introduce yourself. You can't get to know somebody in 60 seconds or even 90 seconds. You get to know who you wanna to get to know. You get to know who should I have a, a, a trike with? Who should I have a one-on-one -on -one with? Who should I see in an affinity group? To whom can I recommend, hey, you're new to providers, you should try this affinity group, it might be good for you. Or come guest here because there's this member I wanna introduce you to. It's the menu, it's the chance for you to figure out who are the people in that group who are getting the most testimonials giving the most testimonials, have the most interesting things to say, and get to know those people better. Socials, happy hours, opportunities at affinity groups, guesting together, bumping into the same person guesting around the country, you get to know them better. Don't worry about how long you have in the meeting. Worry about what you say, what, how you present yourself. Give us a client success story. Give us something we can remember about yourself. Don't give us the blah, 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 drone on elevator speech. Tell us something interesting, and then people will want to get to know you, will reach out to you. It works. It does. I want to make a, a point here that you two might disagree with, and this will be kind of interesting. Um, just because we're saying do more doesn't mean that you need to do it all at once. So I'm going to add a variable into this that you two might disagree with. If you're going to a meeting, and this is one of the biggest objections that I got from people saying, oh, I can't go visit that group when we're in person. I can't visit that group in Walnut Creek because then I have to go back for a troika do you give people permission listening to this saying, you know what, if you can't do it all at once, just do a little bit. And if you need to, maybe even just say no troika. What do you think about no troika? So if the meeting is the menu mm -hmm. where you get to know people's in the troika and digging deep. Now, there are some wasted troikas. There's some troikas of people that you don't have anything in common with and you'll never refer to. And that's unfortunate. But I've had however many troikas I've had in the last 13 and a half years, and I have to tell you, that's less than 1% of my troikas. Most troikas, you know, every group has a troika master. And the reason why they call them a troika master, troika mistress, troika god, whatever they want to call them, that person, it's like a beautiful mind. They see the connections. You should, you're both equestrians. You both ride horses. You are in the same space, but don't know each other yet. You're in a similar geographic area. You two have the same political thought. You two don't look like you've ever met before, but I like you both, so you should both like each other. Whatever the Troika master's thinking, those random connections that you didn't know about are the most amazing things, ways to make new friends, new business colleagues, new referral sources, new resources. If you know someone's good for you, just reach out to them directly. You don't need a troika with them. When you request a troika, you can request it because you haven't been able to sit down with that person directly yet. Maybe there's something interesting about them. Maybe you, you know, you're coming from a different region. But it's those people that you randomly meet and get to know. Think about it. Everybody in Provisors has been vetted by at least somebody. Everyone's here on a personal recommendation of another member. Somebody in the organization already trusts that person. It's not a guarantee they're going to be trustworthy, but it sure makes it a lot more likely. Yeah, I, I agree. My, my personal approach has also been to play a fair amount of trick or roulette, and it has been absolutely wonderful, right? I have met fabulous people at, that I connect with on a personal level. I have learned about 
professions and specialties I had no idea existed, uh, which uh, brings so much to, to my life, my clients, uh, et cetera. And um, yeah, I, I agree with Mark that you can, you can always reach out directly. And so maybe every now and then, if you really don't have the time for a troika, maybe say no troika, but I would, I would caution against no more direct connections. Right. If you say no trick, I would expect that to be because you fully intend to reach out to someone, hopefully a couple of someone's from from that meeting. Well put. And it's that intent, right? I mean, if it's a temporary state of, you know what, I'm just so busy, I'm going to say no trick and still go rather than not go at all. So not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But well, it should always be with the intent of connecting with these people in the meeting, like the menu, like you say, Mark. But then also of having that period truly be temporary and instead blocking off the time long term to dig into these most valuable components of the meeting. Yeah, Mark? It doesn't have to be an hour. You can say, look, you know what? I'd like to schedule a troika for half an hour. And then if we have more to talk about, let's schedule another time. So yes, you can do a little bit. Um, you can say, you know what? I, I really can't do this during the week. I'm really busy with my clients. Can we get together on the weekend or in the evening or whatever? And that's okay too. And it's okay to say, look, I can't do this for the next couple of weeks, but let's do this in three or four weeks, whatever it is. But do something and get to know people and do something more because it all works. Everything you do is guaranteed to pay off if you do it right, but you have to do it right. You have to come in with the right mindset of giving and the open ears to listen to what people are saying and don't commiserate with them. Don't sympathize with them. Listen to their problem. Listen to the thing they're telling you. Figure out what the challenge is and whom do you know that can solve that challenge and make the referral. Because if you tune your hearing to make more and better referrals, people are going to want you in the room more and people are going to request you for choices. Well said. Belle, you want to wrap up? The only thing I would add is uh, that the main room, the, describing that as a menu is such a fabulous uh, concept and I love it. The other thing I would add is that you can sort of get the amuse bouche version while you're in the main room with the chat, right? Reach out, say hello, make that initial connection, um, you know, pay attention to the main content, give people your time and energy. If there's a pause, say hi, make that connection already. Well, One quick thing on the chat. Do not put your elevator speech in the chat. Do not tell us what you do in the chat. That is not the purpose of it. But if you have a meaningful, interesting comment to make about what's being discussed and you don't want to interrupt people, but you want to express your view, put that in the chat because when we see how you think, we get to want to know you. Don't tell us how great you are in the chat. No one cares. That's a waste of space. Tell us something interesting and then we want to hear more about you. So use it effectively. Don't just use it to use it. Well said. And that's a great tie in to provisors in general. If we in, highly encourage you, if it isn't obvious already, dive in. If you're not ready to dive in, just do more. Dip your toe in, do a little bit more bit by bit, and you'll notice it starts pulling you in in a really great way. So we've had some specific how to strategies. So I'll just kind of highlight a couple. I mean, one, make the time. Maybe if it includes you just blocking off time in your calendar ahead of time, look at those provisors monthly schedules and just activate the affinity groups because people like me need to be going to more of those. Maybe some of you do too. <laughs> Block off the time for that and then just plan ahead. Ask ahead. Mark made a great point of sometimes reach out to a group leader to let them know, hey, I'm interested in going to your group. Sometimes you can get in even though it's explicitly not allowed to RSVP anymore. If you want to be there multiple months, let them know ahead. But simply put, you've got a lot of strategies and hopefully a lot of encouragement to just do a little more because when you do a little more, not only will you get more, but also it makes provisors better for all of us. So Mark, thank you so much. Bell, thank you so much, both of you for taking the time and being such great examples, really leading the way and showing the rest of us that we should do more and showing us why. I look Wonderful. Thanks very much. Thank Bye, you, Leah. Great to see you guys today.